When New Yorkers of a certain age talk about the bad old days, they're often talking about the 1970s and 80s, a very different era for the now glittering and largely gentrified metropolis of today. The city was besieged by poverty and teetering on bankruptcy. Times Square, which today looks like a digital Disneyland, was the epicenter of the sex industry. While in the late 1970s, serial killer David Berkowitz, known as the Son of Sam, terrorized the city, killing six people and injuring at least seven others along the way. The subways were different and looked different, too. Tagged with graffiti, filled with character, yes, but also with grime and he a heavy police presence. There was a grit, but also a sense of danger. Crack cocaine and heroin infested the city, driving the crime rate even higher, with much of that crime occurring on the subways, as noted in this clip from NBC Nightly News in 1985. The New York subway system, the Bernard Getz case, the subway shooter, has given the subways fresh notoriety. To many outsiders, even to many who live here, this is an area where fear prevails. In case you missed it, Tom Brokaw referred to the subway shooter known as Bernard Getz. He was also known as the subway vigilante after shooting and injuring four young black men on a train in Manhattan after Getz said they were trying to rob him. This was a huge case that garnered international attention. One of those teens was permanently paralyzed, but Getz was still acquitted of four attempted murder charges and convicted only of carrying an unlicensed handgun. He served eight months in prison, eight months. New York eventually climbed out of that difficult era for many reasons, from falling unemployment in the 1990s to shifting patterns of drug use, and also gun control. New York State and New York City today have some of the strictest rules for gun ownership in the country. And fast forward to literally today, when panic on the New York City subway brought back those bad old memories. Mark Claxton, Frank Figluzzi, and Mark uh, uh, and uh, Naveed Jamali are all still with me. And Mark, I want to go to you because, you know, I, I am I'm old enough to remember some of that of that era. Um, I moved back uh, as a teenager in the 1980s. I was OK. Obviously, I was two years old, but I moved back and I somewhat remember for whatever reason. <laughs> But, I mean, the 1980s was different. Getting on the subways, I remember going up to see my godmother in the Bronx. There was a different vibe and a different kind of fear. There was a lot more open drug use. You would see the heroin man leaning over. You thought he was going to fall off the L train. And there just was a certain more dangerous sense that the men who would try to rub up on you in the train. You had so many more dangers, as, especially as a young woman. And, 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 you know, there was a lot of work put into making New York safe and making New York safer. And one of the big changes were the gun laws. And it is all the way illegal to have a firearm, an open firearm in New York City, except for a few um, instances. So what do you make of the fact that we are now seeing this sort of spasm of gun violence to the point where that is, in a way, what elected uh, the current mayor, Eric Adams? Well, first off, Joy, let me just say that I remember all of that era. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and thanks for making me feel. And, you were four uh, and, and, and I was two. Problem. We're going to work that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I joined the police department in, in 1985 there, so uh, that kind of gives you an indication of, of, of my age. But it was a, a different time, a, a very different time, a significant shift. We were right at the beginning of, of somewhat of a shift in the approach to uh, policing, if you will. Uh, the climate and the tone and tenor of the city was vastly different. Uh, tolerance was, you know, very different. Police enforcement at that time, at that point, uh, was significantly less. Uh, it was right at the time where I joined the police department, moving into the 90s, where there became a shift to become more proactive and much more aggressive styles of policing. And that's when you ran into the, the more of the complications when you dealt mm -hmm. with issues of constitutional protections and rights, et cetera. There was a period of time when, at least on paper, uh, gun possession had mandatory minimums. But the reality of it, and I remember this time specifically, I was in anti-crime in Harlem uh, for a period of time as well before leading into a uh, narcotics division. Um, it, on paper, there were mandatory minimums. The reality of it is that very few people who uh, were found in possession of those weapons uh, actually did the, the, the time that was on the books that they should have uh, uh, should have done. But there's always been an issue with the gun violence in the city. Uh, it's been managed somewhat much better in the, over the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, but it appears that a lot of the old dangers are creeping their way back into the city. And unless you have innovative, uh, uh, outside-of-the-box thinking and, and tactics, 
and focus, uh, you can find yourself back into that situation quite rapidly. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, you, you know, I think you might have served at the same time as my godbrother. We're going to have to talk offline. He joined the force, I believe, in 1990 um, during the NYPD. And, you know, Frank, walk us through how you go from if you have from the federal level, from the FBI level, if you have the firearm and you have the magazines, walk us from there to how you find the person. Because, you know, as we understand, this person is a person of interest. That doesn't mean they did it. I think it's very important we keep showing that man's picture. It doesn't mean he necessarily did it. It means that they're looking to talk to him. But how does the, how do these investigations proceed at the federal level since the FBI is helping? What would they be doing right now? Yeah, FBI and ATF, particularly here where the gun is concerned. So there is a treasure. There's a treasure trove that's been found at this crime scene. I mean, the, the gas mask is going to have fingerprints, even possibly. You know, think about taking on and off a gas mask. You're bringing hair and fiber, even perspiration. You're putting your fingers on it. You've, you're leaving a trail. Now let's go to the gun. Again, we've got a Glock brand, so it's not a ghost gun. It's going to have a serial number. It's going to be traced. We heard at the press conference that they don't believe it was stolen, even better. So there's going to be some track record here of where it came from, who purchased it. Um, e fairly easily traced, we hope. Um, the 30-some-odd shell casings found um, on the scene, all, again, going to be tied to the gun, to the person, perhaps through fingerprints, extended magazines. This is going to be a solid prosecution once they find this suspect. But I think there's a there's a larger um, issue going on here, which is we've got New York State, and I, I can tell you, I'll bet you dollars to donuts if we flipped over to another certain network, Joy, they're going to be saying right now, see that? See, New York has these really strict gun laws, and see, it happened mm -hmm. there, so gun laws are stupid. And so I'm here to tell you that, no, no, actually, if you look at the data, states in, in this country that have those stricter gun laws tend to have less gun crime. It's, it's, it's actually, that's the way it works. The problem is when guns enter from somewhere else.